Hi, welcome to Life in the Arts. I'm Lori Myers, and today our subject matter is Impressionism. We're going to study about the first Impressionist, and his name is Claude Monet. He got his name by doing a painting called Impression Sunrise that you can see right here. It was very blurry. It had dots and dabs of color. It was very, very different than traditional paintings that came before him. He decided that he wanted to capture the light. So he wasn't going to make all the images in an exact replica of what they looked like. He wanted to give an impression. When the critics saw this particular painting at the Salon des Indépendants in Paris, they said, oh, well, that looks like an impression of something. So that's the name, Impressionism, or the Impressionists. And that's how it began with this particular painting. Uh, Monet showed his work, and he was not very well liked by the critics in the beginning. He eventually became very, very well known and one of the masters, and he actually got famous in his own lifetime, which often didn't happen for painters. They didn't become famous until after they died or several years after their, their death, and then somebody would find their fabulous pieces of work and they would become famous then. But Monet kept on with his beautiful painting of Impressionistic work. He went out into the landscape, which was something that they didn't do before this, and he took all his things with him down to the beach, took them to the London Bridge, down to, uh, took them to London, took them to Paris. Everywhere he went, he took his paints, and he would set up his easel in sometimes very, very terrible conditions, like this day was very foggy in London when he was doing Impression Sunrise. He was a master draftsman, which meant that he could draw, draw, draw very well. And the other painters were quite surprised because it's very difficult to repeat yourself in painting and do it over and over and over again and have it be the same way. But he decided to take a flat or an apartment in a place called Rouen, which is across from this cathedral of Rouen, and he would paint the same subject over and over again. And he painted this cathedral many, many times in all different lights, and I'm going to show you several of them right here. This is a very foggy one, but look at all these tiny ones. And they didn't digitally enhance this. They didn't make copies and then color them a different way. There were no computers back then. So each piece he painted, depending on the season and the light, and they changed every time. But the structure itself never changed, and this is such a hard thing to do. These are called series paintings, and Monet painted several series paintings. He did ones of haystacks. He did one of poplar trees that were not far from his home in Giverny. He did these ones of Rouen, and he did ones of the Japanese footbridge that over, went over a pond that he had at home, and of water lilies. And so he's very famous for those paintings. Now, here's the Japanese footbridge that he built at his home. He had a wonderful pink house in Giverny, and he had this bridge built, this Japanese bridge built. The reason he had it built like this is that he saw the Japanese paintings and um, the wood blocks. They had come to France really in crates as packing materials, sometimes to the cafes. And when the Impressionists saw this artwork, they loved it. They just, they went crazy for it, and they all started collecting it. So he thought it would be nice to have a footbridge that went over the pond. When he first got the property, there was no pond right there. He convinced the city fathers to reroute the river so he could have a nice pond and, and something flow through his property. At one time in his career, he had at least six gardeners working on the property to create beautiful flower gardens to keep up this pond, and it's still there as a museum. So if you ever get to France, you could go see this because it's really, really beautiful. So this is one of the series paintings that he did of the bridge. It's called the Japanese Footbridge, and you can see this in many, many different colors. This is this one like this. 
There's a little one in a postcard, and his stuff is on all kinds of things. It's on mugs, and it's on bags, and postcards, and all kinds of things. And this is a little different colorway. It's a little bit more vibrant green. And as he progressed in his life through, through his work, his colors became kind of darker and redder because he eventually started to lose his vision. And he wore these wonderful little red glasses. They're on the front of this great book, or green glasses. And it kind of helped him with the red. Red and green are complementary colors. And so in order to subdue the reds that he saw in his eyes, they w made him these little glasses. Eventually, he had uh, cataract surgery, and he was OK. But um, I want to just show you this painting, because as his vision started to fade, his painting started to get darker and kind of almost abstract. You almost can't tell what they are with his dots and dabs of color. So we're going to do the Japanese footbridge today, and it's done with tag board and acrylic paint. Acrylic paint dries very quickly, so we'll work quickly, but it's great because we can overlap the paint right over the other paint, and it doesn't you know, smush together like watercolor or some other paints or like oil paints. We can work really quick over the top. Now, I'm going to show you different color ways that I've done. And I'm not Monet, of course, but these are my impressions of the footbridge. OK, there's one done with a white background in kind of a light tone. Here's one that is done with very dark paint, many, many more layers. This is done with a different color way. This is done very soft and lightly. OK, this one is the ground color. And so they all read a little bit differently. But what we're going to do is we're going to start out with what is called a ground color or a base color. And this piece of paper kind of shows you the different lights and darks around the painting. So as we look at a Monet, if we were to concentrate on this big one, we can see where the lights and darks are. I want you to make note right here. These are willows that kind of the stroke is definitely vertical. This is another kind of tree where the stroke is kind of curled and circular. This is the down up brush stroke that I use a lot that comes from the bottom up here and like little bushes are on the pond. There's a darkness over here. Okay, so when I'm trying to copy a master, and many of the great artists did copy the masters and to get better and better at their own work, um, I'm looking for those lights and darks. So that's what we're going to look for today. So if you have a pie pan or a paper plate or something, you can just put your paints out on it. And I use just little acrylics. And I'll take a sponge. And it's damp, but it's not wet. Okay, so that it picks up the paint. And I don't want too much paint on my sponge at the beginning. And I'm just going to kind of map out where the lights and darks are, like I showed you on that other piece of paper. Okay, so these are vertical lines. And I definitely want it to be spongy and dotty. Okay, so don't drag your sponge, dot your sponge. Little light strokes. I do have a way to fix it. If you get too dark and you don't have any of the light coming through, we can fix that in the end. But I don't want you to rely on that. I would rather have you try to get these vertical strokes in. Remember, this is a willow. We're going to do lots of layers of color. But this is the initial ground color and with the vertical lines. Okay. Now over on this side, we're going to go into more of a circular pattern. That got on there a little bit thick, but as I said, I have a way that we can kind of fix that. And you definitely want the sponge to be spongy so the light is coming through. That's important. The Impressionists, their big main goal and main focus in life 
life was to capture the light. How did the light play on the subject matter? What was happening outside? Where were the lights and darks? Okay, that was a big thing for them. So in order to capture the light, we do want to maybe keep a little bit of the background showing. Although if you don't, we're going to capture the light anyway by coming back in with lighter colors. So this is the way you get your ground color on. Now, notice that these are vertical. These are kind of round. When you go to do water, water is generally painted horizontally. So I have to give the feeling of perspective. So I want it to move back in the painting. How can I do that without you know, making uh, diagonal lines, really? I want to move you back there. So I don't want diagonal lines. I want horizontal lines. But if you make a small one there, and as you move forward, your lines get longer and longer, you're going to see that it actually takes you into the back of the painting. Can you see that already? I know they're very light lines because we're going to add more and more paint. But start out small, back here. This is a rather small little piece. And widen as you come out. And make sure that all your lines are horizontal. That's real important because if they're horizontal, it'll look like the water is moving, and it'll look like those little beads of light. If you ever kind of look out on the water and see the shimmer, shimmery sunlight, that's what Monet wanted to capture. He liked how those little beads of color played on the top of the water. And so you get that, and if you look out in life, in, in nature, you'll see that they do kind of go horizontally. Okay, so there's kind of our base color. It's not a whole bunch of paint on the paper yet, but it's kind of a general feeling of where the lines go and the lights and darks. So that's one color green, okay? Now I'm going to use another color green because in Monet's paintings there were many, many greens. This is just a tad darker, not much, but I can come in and do some more dots with this. It's not making a big difference, just a little bit darker. I still want my sponge to really be spongy. I want to see those little sponge lines because in what Monet did is he took a brush and did dots and dabs and dots and dabs of color over and over and over again to create these impressions. We're, we're kind of cheating because we're using a sponge and so we can get those dots and dabs a lot quicker. Okay, now here's a darker green. And I don't want to cover up totally where I've gone before. I want to kind of edge them, or I kind of want to shadow them, but I don't want to completely get rid of the paint that I had before. So I'm going to go over with a light hand, but I still have to go vertically right here, because they are willows, and we want to stay with the same line that we initially created. But do you see how they're filling in now, and they're kind of looking a little denser so that you can't really see through this tree, but you still have some light coming out. And, and then this side, I'm going to do the same, where I'm just making little dots and dabs. This kind of has a square edge to it. I don't really want to show up that square edge, so I'm going to try to come to this corner and see whether I can make more dots. You don't want the pattern of the actual square of the sponge. Okay, so you use the sponge, but you really want to avoid getting that square on there. And you're going to cover up most of the paper, but that creamy color of the tag board is still going to come out, still going to show so that we've captured the light. And you can come all the way to the end of your paper. I'm not going to because I don't want to get it on the 
paper behind it, but you could put a newspaper underneath and then just go all the way to the edge. Or you could trim your painting down when you're finished. Lots of times I'll do a painting and if there's a, just a little view that I really like in the painting, I will cut the whole other part of the painting out and just keep that one little view that I love. Okay, so I'm just adding a little shadow under the water lines that I already made. And I'll move these out. I want to give the impression that it's water and that this is something the lily pads would be able to sit upon. And I don't want all that cream color to show too much, so I'm going to be real light right here and just kind of I have almost no paint on my sponge right now, and I can kind of go fill it in like this, and it really gives that wonderful impressionistic feeling with those dots and dabs of paint. Monet was very different in the way that he painted. People hadn't done that before, and uh, it was so beautiful. And you know, up close, it doesn't really look like much, and as you draw away from it farther and farther away, it looks more and more beautiful. Okay, so there's kind of still the base colors. I've got this kind of light green, so I can come in now and capture a little bit of the light. And these aren't big changes, but they layer and layer and layer the paint. And that's what makes this effective, is that the paint is layered and layered so that you get lots of different lights and darks. And you don't want to totally get rid of what you've done. This is kind of a little bit of a corrector. It doesn't have quite as much green in as it maybe should. But I really want to get more and more paint on without making a big drama to it. Just little nuances of a change in value of the color. Do you remember what a change in value means? Value in painting is how much light or how much darkness is in a color. Okay, so even though these are all greens, they do have a change in value. They progress from the lightest lights to the darkest darks. This one green is kind of rather a dark green, but then this one that I'm using is really quite light, but they're all in the same family of greens. And these are all kind of muted greens. There's not a bright Christmas green here. Although, if you wanted to do it in that color way, you could. I mean, I did it in many different color ways depending on the greens that I had. Okay, now I'm going to use some blue. There's quite a bit of blue. Let's look at Monet's again. There's quite a bit of blue up here at the top, and there's quite a bit of blue in the water, and there's some down here on the bushes. So, and it's real good, if you can, to have several different posters or paintings of Monet's actual piece. He has many that you could copy the poplars and, and the haystacks and the bridge. But it's nice to be able to look at all the little dots and dashes and all the changes of value and the changes in the light and shadow rather than to just guess or to just look at mine. I like you to be able to see what they look like in real life in the, in the paintings. And they're there are many places. There's many, many books. There's a darling book called Linnea that has his whole life in it, and that's a wonderful, fun book to read. And there's many, many things that are written about Monet, so you won't have trouble finding copies of the paintings. Okay, so I said we had a little blue up here, so let's add a few little dots and dabs to the blue. And you know what? You don't want these evenly spaced apart. You know, you're, you're, not, you're, tr you're not trying to give an evenness to it. You're just trying to give a shading to it of the lights and darks and of the colors. Okay, so you don't want them too evenly spaced apart. It won't creates too much symmetry and it won't look good. Okay, my little touch of blue in the back there, if I can make it small enough. And I'm using the same sponge and you can just use different sides of the sponge. But actually, the paint dries up so quickly, really, that you don't have to change your sponge. And you can use these over if you rinse them out in the end, but don't rinse them while you're doing it because then the paint becomes too runny.
too watery, so you, you just use the same old sponge. I've used these for a long time, and they still work. You think they wouldn't because they get as hard as a rock, but then if you wet them, they kind of work again. All right, so there's some blue shadows. I have to see whether I got them kind of too evenly spaced. Sometimes that happens. You want to create little vistas of the blue. Now this kind of has some plants that kind of come up like this. And remember, we're just trying to give an impression, so it's not an exact science here. We're just doing the little blobs. Oh, that went on a little too thick, so we'll correct that. That's good. I'll leave that thick so you can see how I can correct that little space. Okay, now, I've got several different colors of blue, and we have time, so let's try this one. Because the more that you add just the little changes, these subtle changes, they're not giant changes, they're just little subtle changes, the, the better your painting will turn out. Just little, and it just creates that light. It just absolutely picks up like the sun is shining on the water. And I'm not going to do too much more than that. This blue is pretty intense, so maybe that's all I'm going to do there. But you can buy very muted colors, or you can buy bright colors, and they all turn out beautiful, even though you, if you're going to use muted colors, use all muted. If you're going to use bright, use all bright, because the mixture of the two is kind of garish. Okay, now, for the bridge part, this is the hardest part, because we think of the bridge as being a giant arch, and it doesn't really arch very much at all. If, if you look at Monet's and you put a piece of paper next to it, you see that the bend is not a lot. It's not a total straight line, but it's not a huge big curve to it either. So I'm going to take a little bit of this brighter blue on the edge of my sponge, and I'm not going to use a whole bunch to begin with. I want to be very, very light-handed right here in case I make a mistake that I can kind of be able to get rid of it. And I'm going to look at this back, back place. Now your bridge is not going to go directly in the center of your paper either. It's a little bit um, up in the top third. So the bottom of the bridge will come right along here. And notice I'm not making a huge curve, and I'm being very light-handed to begin with. I always can come in and make it darker, but it's hard once it's on there to really get rid of it. Okay, so that's my first bend, and I'm going to copy that line up on top with the second part, or the top part of the bridge, and that line has to be the same bend or the same curve as the one below it. That's kind of how they work. And you've got supports that go vertically, like this. And I know you probably wish that you could use a brush, but I think it's more fun to try it just with a sponge. A brush has a tendency to give you less of an impressionistic feeling because the stroke is so solid and they really just made these with dots and dabs of color. So my students always paint this with just sponges only. And there's kind of two on either side of the bridge. You're getting both of the supports and he showed that, Monet did. And then you have that center beam that's kind of going through. And notice, uh, this is a light hand. I'm not making this real strong. I can always come in and fix it up a little bit more if I want it darker. But I like that wonderful impressionistic dot and dab to the stroke. If I can't see my bridge at all, I'm going to have to come in and make it stronger, of course. But I'd rather be light-handed at first and then come in with a stronger look. All right, can you see that bridge? Is that kind of showing up? It shows up up close, and sometimes I'll have to put it far away from me, 
and you might want to just stand up and take a look at your bridge when you get to that point. If I've gone too quickly, don't worry about it. You can just always catch up. I paint pretty quickly. I've done this several times, so it's a little bit easier for me to go quick now because I've done it so often. Okay, so that has the impression of a bridge. It's not exactly like Monet's, of course, but it does have the feeling that the bridge is crossing over the pond. Now, I'm going to take a couple shades of pink and make the water lilies. This is where you have to be very careful, and I'll tell you why. Because if you make too many flowers, you're not going to see any other part of the painting. Your eyes are just going to go to the pink, and it kind of destroys it. So you have to be very careful. Use a light hand. Don't get carried away. We know an odd number in painting is better than an even number. So I'll go for an odd group of flowers. And what I'm going to do first is I'll use this light pink, and I'm going to look around to where I want these. Now, I don't want these. These are just little dabs of color. I don't want them evenly spaced apart. Okay, that won't be, uh, you know, it'll be too symmetrical, excuse me, as it goes around. So you want just a few little dabs. So there's one, two, three, four. I'll do one down here in the foreground, number five. And those are hardly on there at all. Now, take another corner with this raspberry color, and I'll just try to dot it in here just a little bit, just so you have two little shades to the flowers. Okay? So, those are hardly any at all. Actually, this even looks too strong to me. But I'll try to mush it up, get rid of it a little bit. You can do more if you want. I just, and certainly in Monet's, if you want to look again, he has several on there. But they're just tiny, tiny dots and dabs of color. You don't want big, big uh, lilies, water lilies around. Okay, and I've got, maybe that's too dark. I think I'll take a little bit of this dark green that we used before. I don't want to totally change the, the palette that I used because it's pretty soft. And... I don't want to get pink in there, so I'll get that on the edge of my sponge if I could get it to pick up. There we go. And I'm going to just put a little base to these. Okay? Not much color, but just a little base because lily pads sit on a big green leaf. But I don't want to paint that green leaf. I want to just give you the impression that they're sitting on something and that there's a little shadow underneath the lily. But these are still little dots and dabs of color. I want to be careful and not overdo that. Okay, now once I've done that and I'm looking at it and I think, okay, that looks just fine. But maybe this little green part right here is just a little too thick. Okay? So here is the way that you can get rid of it. If you can find a little clean corner, you can take your yellow or that light green and you can kind of go over the top of it. Don't totally get rid of your painting, but just go over it a little bit, and there, it kind of disappears. It's kind of like um, whiteout for painting. Okay, so now we've done the Japanese footbridge from Monet, and you see whether you can capture the light. That's what the Impressionists were trying to do. That was Monet's whole feeling, was to capture the light, and he did a good job of it. Thanks for being with me today.